All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to this webinar on funding basics for Great Lakes communities uh, with a focus on the National Coastal Resilience Fund. Um, I am Shannon Doherty. I'm with DEC's Great Lakes Watershed Program and am pleased to be here today uh, co-hosting this with Syracuse University's Environmental Finance Center, uh, Throw Environmental, in collaboration with uh, NIFWIF or the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, resiliency, as we all know, is top of mind these days. And there's nothing like um, taking this time at the end of the year to really look ahead into the next year and uh, look forward and, and start planning for those uh, resilience focused uh, grant proposals, projects, um, ecosystem health projects and the like. Uh, I'm with our watershed program here at DEC, like I said, and so our work is guided by our state action plan called the Great Lakes Action Agenda. Within that agenda, we actually have a goal that is focused uh, entirely on enhancing community resiliency and ecosystem integrity. And, and on that note, um, really appreciate the alignment that this National Coastal Resilience Fund uh, grant program has with that particular goal. And so uh, with that, uh, we can go to the next slide and I'll give you a sense of what we'll be covering today as a part of this presentation. Uh, so we have a few different speakers, as I mentioned, we'll be starting with some funding basics, uh, kind of going over the 101s of all of the different considerations you need to uh, take into account when you're looking at grant opportunities and considering how they fit your project. Uh, then we'll be moving into the uh, National Coastal Resilience Fund overview uh, and talking a little bit more about uh, specifics on um, that particular grant opportunity and how to uh, pursue it uh, if it's a good fit for you. And then we will be wrapping up with an audience uh, question and answer session. So um, that, uh, you know, you can wait till the end uh, for your questions, or you can pop them right in the Q&A. So there's a question and answer um, option at the bottom of your screen. And so throughout the presentation, as you do think of things, uh, feel free to uh, make a note of them in that uh, chat feature, or not the chat feature, the, the Q&A feature. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to move right along and start introducing our speakers. Uh, with us today, we have Joanne Fro. Uh, she's the president of Throw Environmental. Joanne has served as an environmental policy and finance expert in a variety of capacities for over 20 years, including as deputy secretary for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, chair of the EPA Environmental Financial Advisory Board, and director at the University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center. Joanne received her master's degree from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy, and she resides in Bristol, Rhode Island. She's also joined by Kyle Gray. He is a project partner for Throw Environmental. He leads the company's work with the Southeast New England Program uh, Technical Assistance Network, while also supporting its full range of resilience and financing projects. Kyle has a Master of Arts in Marine Affairs, a graduate certificate in community planning, a BA in political science and Italian, and a micro-credential in diversity and inclusion facilitation, all from the University of Rhode Island and he currently resides in Washington, DC. And then last but not least, and our first speaker today is Christopher Dodson. He is the Associate Director at Syracuse University's Environmental Finance Center. He provides technical assistance to local government leaders on topics related to asset management, land use and comprehensive planning, stormwater management, and other topics related to local infrastructure, leadership, management, and finance. He was also the coordinator for Onondaga County's Save the Rain program and has a master's degree from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry and a Master of Arts from Syracuse University. So with that, um, I will hand it over to Chris to carry us forward. Great, thanks Shannon. <clears throat> um, so like Shannon said, I, uh, I'm the, the Associate Director of the Environmental Finance Center at Syracuse University. Uh, the first few slides to this are, um, are uh, going to uh, really just explain to you the, um, some, some tips and, and tricks I'd say that, that I've seen along the way as we work with local government in applying for grant funding uh, 
And so my, my slides are going to be more general uh, and not tied specifically to any of the guidelines or, or requirements to the funding program that Joanne and Kyle will be talking about. Um, we do work, for a little context, we do work uh, a lot with local government in helping guide them in uh, securing funding for primarily for water, wastewater, stormwater projects. Um, that's often tied to resiliency work, um, the planning aspects of, of those projects as well. Um, and other types of things that uh, you could get state and federal funding for. Um, and so as we do that work and as we interact with uh, local government and the funding agencies, um, you know, we've heard some feedback from both ends, from the communities and from the agencies. And so that's the kind of stuff I'll be talking about uh, today. So uh, Kyle, you can advance to the next slide. So if you're of a certain age, you probably remember this guy uh, from the 80s and the 90s, always talking about uh, his very thick book of, um, of free government money. Um, so, you know, I'm here to tell you there's no such thing as free money. Even if it's a grant, there are requirements that come with that money. Sometimes it's cost share requirements, often cost share requirements. Um, so that's money or other um, other things that you should track, like staff time, et cetera, um, that would go toward that, that grant. Also, um, writing a grant application isn't necessarily difficult, but there are a lot of moving parts. If you're a municipality, you often have to get a, a board resolution. That takes time, right? So you can't just apply for a grant that's due next week uh, if you need a board resolution and the board doesn't meet again until next month. Um, also, the administration of a grant, tracking costs, getting invoices, putting things out to bid, um, writing the reports, submitting things. Grants are reimbursement. Uh, and so having that money, uh, putting that money out in front and waiting for the check to come back to reimburse you on those costs. So it does take a lot of time. Um, and, and to be aware of that. Um, before getting into the process and then looking at other looking comparing that to the potential for internal revenue sources or, or alternative revenue sources above and beyond or instead of a grant or or even a loan. Um, you also want to look at the priority for the project. Is it a priority for your community? Uh, is it a priority? Is it the type of project that is prioritized by the funding source? Um, and how does this project fit into the big picture for your community? Not all projects do, right? Maybe you get money to put in a new playground uh, at, at the, you know, at the town park or something. I mean, that's a quality of life issue that does fit into the big picture, but it's not necessarily connected to, uh, you know, funding that you secure the following year to do uh, stormwater improvements, um, you know, not adjacent to the park, right? So, uh, Kyle, next slide. Um, and so once you have that project idea, you want to flesh it out, give it some thought. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these. Uh, you can, but I, I'll point out a few that are really important. You know, being able to describe the project thoroughly, um, what's in your head and what you put on the paper um, may, may be the same thing for you. But if you give me that sheet of paper uh, and I read it, I'm not, I may not, what's in my head may not be what's in your head, right? So that means <clears throat> when, you just, when you describe the project, you want to be clear so that it is not misinterpreted or confusing to the, the grant reviewer. You also want to state, um, clearly state goals and objectives, like why are you doing this? What, what's going to be the benefit? What problem are you addressing? Um, how will that problem be improved? Showing that you've thought through the costs um, and that you can uh, create an evaluation for success. An evaluation for success is um, not just building the playground or not just doing stormwater enhancements um, to capture more storm runoff. Um, the evaluation of success is is doing it on time and under budget. <laughs> um, also having an operations and maintenance plan in place and a funded operation and maintenance plan in place. Um, and maybe metrics like, you know, increased park 
uh, usage because you have new and, and better playground equipment or um, your stormwater enhancements have are not only capturing what you modeled or planned that they would, but they're capturing actually more water and have triggered additional projects along that same street corridor uh, because stormwater and inf other types of infrastructure are economic development. Um, I did mention O&M, so you do want to think about the, the costs, uh, the life cycle cost of whatever project it is. Even that playground is going to require uh, investment into the future. Uh, repainting, removing graffiti, unfortunately, uh, something breaks and has to be replaced, whatever. Right. So you want to make sure you're, you're thinking about uh, its life cycle cost. Kyle, next. Uh, and then thinking about the grant, right? So are you eligible? Not all, uh, not all uh, types of people, you know, municipalities, school districts, soil and water conservation districts, uh, schools, um, uh, higher institutes of higher education. Um, not all folks are eligible for all grants. So you're gonna wanna, most of the time municipalities are, um, but you wanna make sure that you're eligible. And you can also look at that as an opportunity for partnership. You know, maybe the Soil and Water Conservation District is eligible as well. Reach out to them, see if maybe they could be the main applicant. Maybe they can provide some match. Maybe it can help you do some of the design work. Um, and then looking at what match is required. Sometimes it's one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, sometimes it's 90-10. Sometimes it's, a, you know, 75-25. Uh, and how can you calculate that match? Are you doing a cash match? Um, are you going to um, count uh, staff time? And I, I, I usually recommend that people do count staff time. It adds up on administering these grants, but then you have to track it. Um, and um, anyway, so matches is, is kind of a, a discussion in, in and of itself. <clears throat> when evaluating a grant, you also want to look at how many are funded. Um, you know, maybe they have a million dollars and they fund 10, or maybe they have a million dollars and they fund 30, right? That'll tell you about the, the, the range of, of grants awarded, so how much money you might receive. Um, but it also tells you, depending on the competitiveness of the grant, what, what's the likelihood that you'll be awarded? Can you meet all of the requirements? Different grants have prevailing wage requirements um, and other types of uh, procurement requirements. Um, and then, and also timeline uh, requirements. Um, and then also thinking about the geographic spread, right? Um, you know, I sit here in Syracuse in central New York. I know many of you are in Western New York, Buffalo area, um, Southern tier. What's the geographic spread? If we were talking about, and I know NIFWIF is different, and Joan will talk a little bit about the targeted areas for that grant, but if this is a New York State grant and they had eight available, uh, they're gonna make eight awards, you know, they're gonna spread them around the state, right? They're not gonna give four to Central New York or four to the greater Buffalo, Western New York area. They're gonna spread them around. So being cognizant of that, maybe even knowing that your neighbors are also applying for the same grant, will help you discern kind of the availability of the grant to you. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, this is some feedback I've gotten from some of the state agencies, um, primarily uh, on, on grants that aren't awarded, at least awarded the first time. And it's, they didn't, the, the guidelines weren't followed, there are missing pieces. Many grant programs provide checklists of things that you need to provide, because there are a lot of things you need to pull together. Uh, when people think of grant writing, I think they might think of this big monster document that you just have to type out 27 pages worth of, of text and narrative. That's not so much the case. Um, you do need to describe your project, but you also have to provide sometimes feasibility studies. Um, you know, If we award this grant, we wanna make sure that it's actually feasible for you to build it. Don't waste our time unless you can show us that's the case. Um, putting together budgets and, and getting other kind of uh, administrative documents. So there's a lot of moving parts. And so sometimes these guidelines get missed. And so therefore they get disqualified for funding for that reason. Maybe it doesn't meet the program priorities, uh, stormwater project, you know, funded 
uh, you know, being proposed to uh, CDBG uh, community development block grant is probably not going to be quite as strong as if it was applying to the green innovation grant program. These are two state programs that some may be familiar with. Um, and the green innovation grant program funds stormwater all day long, right? So it may not be right in the, the wheelhouse of the program you're applying for. Incomplete or not on time, these are very easy ways to have your proposal declined. Um, poor demonstration of need. Uh, there's always more need than there is money. And so really showing that you need the, the funding will help uh, help put you in that in that winner's box, so to speak. Um, you need to be able to show that you have the, demon, the, the capacity to manage the grant once it's awarded or that you have uh, that you will contract out the work you know, to a consulting firm or or work with the soil and water conservation district or some other uh, type of partner project or excuse me, um, project partner. <laughs> um, you wanna be able to show how you're gonna scale this out, implement it. Timelines are good ways to do that. Um, unrealistic budget. Again, they don't wanna waste money. They don't wanna underfund something that they know is gonna end up costing more in the long run because it's gonna be a hassle for you and a hassle for them. Uh, nor do they wanna give you more money to do something that they know you can get at a, at a lower rate because that's not a good use of their funds. And then a greater cost than benefit. This is a little bit different, right? Uh, maybe you are serving a community of, of 1,500 people um, and you want to spend, uh, you know, four or five million on a stormwater project that really won't um, drastically impact or benefit the stormwater um, volume in that community, nor is that community um, um, experiencing severe flooding or anything else, right? Good project, just maybe the benefit isn't there for the cost. And then having a poorly written proposal. Uh, next, Kyle. So the good news is that your project is probably gonna be more likely to be uh, funded the second or even third time around. Uh, only one proposal in fives turned down because of the idea wasn't good. Um, if your proposal is rejected, call the uh, call the project officer right away. The, the person who manages the funds on behalf of the funding agency, uh, they usually they are almost always receptive to either having a phone call with you or providing written comment as to why your project was not funded. Um, that is great advice. Uh, my center is almost exclusively uh, funded by grants. And so whenever we don't get grants and we get that feedback, it's very, very helpful for us for, <clears throat> excuse me, either for the next funder uh, going to a different funding program uh, or the next round of funding through that program. Uh, so then just rewrite, revise, get that feedback, rewrite, revise, and then resubmit. Next slide. So a little bit about writing. Um, you want to write to the funding source. Uh, again, they're interested in funding projects that also benefit their funding program. They, they have bosses too, right? <laughs> they have people that they need to go to to show that, the, that their, their funding program is valuable, should be continued to be funded, and is funding good projects. So keep that in mind when you're trying to convince them that your project is right for their, their pot of money. Make sure you're answering the five W's, uh, who, what, where, when, why, and also how. Um, don't write in first person. Um, be clear and concise. And again, the, the, the clarity issue um, is often best um, addressed by uh, having someone read what you've written when you're done and then have them try to communicate it back to you. Uh, if they see what you see on that paper, that's great. That's clear. Uh, if they don't, then it needs to be reworked a little bit. And, and being concise, being brief, uh, often these applications are word limited or character limited. So almost by necessity, you have to be brief. Write to inform, but also write to persuade. Um, and you can persuade folks and inform them by using data. You want to establish credibility, uh, putting in hyperbole or biased language or opinion isn't going to get you anywhere. Uh, and finally, you want to, as much as possible, avoid passive voice. 
Uh, next slide. And for those of you who don't know, often scientific writing is in passive voice. Instead of um, subject, verb, object, it's object, verb, subject, right? So Mary kicked the ball, that's active voice. Passive voice is the ball was kicked by Mary. Um, so you wanna take agency over the, the project that you're proposing to them. You wanna say, this is a project that this town will be working on. All right, um, editing your grant. So it's always best to give it a day, uh, put stuff together, put it away, give your mind and your eyes uh, a breather, and then and then go back and, and revise it. This is a good time. You know, if I finished writing a grant now, I'd give it to a colleague this afternoon, ask them to take the afternoon in the morning to look at it. And we'd chat tomorrow around this time. And then I'd go back to it, finish it up by tomorrow at the end of the day, right? Um, so Kyle, next slide, the other things I mentioned. So that is it for me, that was brief, but just some things to think about as you're writing proposals. I think I actually lost a slide or two, actually somewhere in translation. You know, a couple of other tips I wanted to mention very briefly is make sure you're using colorful language, the colorful and descriptive language. And the title is like kind of the first entree into your, um, your, your project. Remember, these folks are um, are reviewing probably dozens, if not more, applications. And the first thing they see is that title. You want to make that title descriptive, uh, as and and give them that first kind of uh, that first glance at, at what it is that you're trying to propose. So, if you ever have any questions or comments or need any help about um, fu funding. Um, or talking about water and stormwater, wastewater operations, and or excuse me, management and finance, um, give us a call. And this is my contact information. So now I'm going to kick it over to uh, my colleague, Joanne Throw. Uh, Joanne and I have worked together for a, a really long time uh, and uh, wearing different hats. So it's nice to be able to work with her again, uh, talking to you guys on this webinar. So uh, Joanne. Take it away. Thanks, Chris. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Shannon's intro and um, New York DC setting us up with this opportunity to connect with all of you on this webinar. Um, connecting again with the Syracuse EFC, they, they do such great work in the region, EPA's region two. Um, so <clears throat> we would like to take what Chris said. He had some wonderful tips. And we want to make it very specific about um, a, a funding opportunity. And I'm thrilled um, to be bringing you this information. And actually we have a little update in the slides. So um, we'll talk about what's new and what's coming up, uh, spe specifically if you're in the Great Lakes region that we're hoping um, many of you are calling in from or elsewhere. So Kyle, let's go into applying what Chris said to a specific funding opportunity. So first, I just want to let you know why Throw Environmental is talking about a NIFWF uh, grant program. And <clears throat> so as Chris said, so National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, excuse the acronym for NIFWF, but everybody knows it by NIFWF. So National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, they do such amazing work. Um, many of you probably on this webinar have received at one point in time um, one of their funding opportunities. And, uh, you know, they can't be everywhere at all times. And this particular National Coastal Resilience Fund we're going to talk about <clears throat> is an opportunity for us to be bringing uh, additional technical capacity and looking at climate resilience and helping to move this fund forward. We provide a follow-up. Um, we do things like this webinar, but we give feedback on proposals. Um, we also help with grantees. And so it is you know, such a privilege to be part of this. Throw Environmental works on uh, climate resilience, planning, and financing. So this is absolutely in our wheelhouse. So Kyle, next slide. <clears throat> so just explaining why we're talking about this on um, behalf of NIFWF, but you know, the exciting opportunity here is uh, the NCRF, the National Coastal Resilience Fund. 
Now, we're bringing this to you because many of you probably are very familiar with some of the other more traditional funding opportunities that have been around for a while, but this is fairly new. This uh, particular fund has been out since 2018, so this might be the first time you are hearing about it. And it's it's pretty exciting fund because of the fact that there are multiple partnerships involved in the NCRF. Uh, so not only do you have NIFWF and NOAA coming together, now you have Department of Defense, EPA, AT&T, Transre, Shell, um, uh, Occidental Petroleum. Not often do you find multiple entities of this scale really working towards a particular issue and then something that's near and dear to all our hearts is becoming more climate resilient as a community. So this fund, uh, what I want to make clear, and then Kyle will follow up with uh, specifics in a couple minutes, but this particular fund supports nature-based projects. So the idea is to support community resilience. So that community resilience in the coastal communities and not or, but and enhance habitat for fish and wildlife. It's you have to have both with this particular fund. Now on this third bullet, I want to make mention of this. This is a historic level of investment coming in. It has been um, on average since the first uh, grant funded uh, opportunity in 2018, it's been about 30 million. And so you are not reading this incorrectly. That does say 140 million dollars available in 2022. So now suddenly everybody on this webinar is paying attention. You're saying how much? That is true. Nationally available in 2022 will be $140 million. That makes this grant program very, very exciting. So I know I've got your attention now. And so all the tips that Chris has been sharing with you, we're going to bring those points home. Uh, this is an opportunity um, with the multiple partners who are involved with this on that little box. You'll see an opportunity to really advance the ball on climate resilience. So let's see what's in this particular grant program. Kyle, next. All right. So I mentioned it's, a, it's an and situation here. So very exciting opportunity to look at community resilience to enhance that protection, right? And look at um, communities that are suffering from uh, impacts of sea level rise. And, you know, many of us in the communities are dealing with flooding as a major issue, coastal erosion, uh, increased frequency of storms. Um, there has to be with this particular fund, like I'm saying, that protection of uh, habitat and fish and wildlife, that connection's there. Now, when you're looking at, well, how, that's not my particular expertise. How am I maybe a planner in a municipal government? How am I really going to make that connection? Because, uh, you know, I'm not a natural resource expert, and then you would look at partnerships. Chris talked about that, the opportunity to really engage others. If that is not your expertise, it's better on a proposal that you seek out additional partners, right? And make your idea for a proposal, what your project need is to build that, uh, you know, that project description, make it very clear, but also engage those additional partners. So we wanna see both of these things and then, you know, we've got a couple examples here, one in North Beach, Maryland, um, of marsh grant pla planting, marsh grass planting, thank you, and then community resilience planning. And Kyle, in a couple minutes, is going to talk about more specifics on this. But this is, in general, the overall purpose of the National Coastal Resilience Fund. Next slide, Kyle. And so you're wondering, well, how do I know if I'm in the footprint for this, you know, uh, fund? And NIFWF has, it's, they're pretty straightforward on their tools and available resources and information. Um, you know, what's available out there? So you could look on a map that NIFWF has and zoom into your particular area, all the U.S. coastal states, and we are including the Great Lakes and territories in this. 
So you can go into your specific community and see if you're eligible. I'm not sure exactly. I looked at the registration list earlier and it's very exciting who we have attending here. And um, so you please, we encourage you to be able to type in where your, where your community is and, and take a look. If you fall within that orange area, you see it just covers all along the coast and, and see if you would be eligible. Next. So who is eligible? Um, we've got the traditional, you know, many of us are used to grants and you've got the traditional state, tribal, territorial agencies, municipal governments, nonprofits, educational institutions. Uh, we have also on this one, it's a very exciting opportunity but because it also covers the for-profit organizations. And you see a little asterisk here. And we wanna make note that this isn't a procurement opportunity for the, those who might be from consulting firms or whatnot. Um, but NIFWIF understands well that the partnering aspect of this you know, is very important for uh, communities to move forward on particular projects. So uh, federal organization, semi-federal, and this is, you know, a little unusual because you can have somebody like a C grant uh, who is partially um, federally funded who would be eligible, but normally, obviously, not a federal um, agencies are best in partnerships. And so then we have the ineligible on the other side. But for the most, uh, for the most part, the people who are on this webinar, um, I hope you're considering this fund. So next, want to pull out a few points that Chris made um, about effective proposals and, and writing grants and apply it here. Um, so first of all, you, you would see the RFP and the RFP traditionally comes out early spring. Um, what we're talking about now and why we're talking about it now with you is the fact that you shouldn't wait to the last minute to think about your proposal. It takes conversations. We are looking at proposals that would probably be most competitive if you start planning ahead and looking at that clear benefit to the community in terms of resilience, be it the flooding or erosion uh, control measures. And then, of course, it has to be nature-based solutions um, and have that clear benefit back to fish and wildlife and habitat. Next, and a few other points that I really do want to make before Kyle goes into the details. Now, when Chris was describing about evaluating proposals, you know, the, the grant funders, be it New York DEC or NIFWIF, they've been doing this a long time. They know a good project when they see it. And so when you're looking at meaningful community partnerships, uh, you know, they're looking to see that. Make sure you're also looking at the scale of your project too. Are you really addressing your problem um, in a way that is meaningful? And is there a, an opportunity to look at innovation? Um, innovative techniques are encouraged with this fund and testing out pilot techniques at scale. Very exciting opportunity. The idea of transferability, what are those lessons learned for a community that you can bring that makes it very interesting as well. And, you know, are we incorporating or integrating uh, policy or programs that come from this? What are the benefits to the underserved community? What are they? Can we bring them in terms of resilience? Because there, as we all know, there are many. So are we being inclusive as possible? So Chris mentioned cost effectiveness when you're thinking about your proposal, uh, you know, and your project, are you making sure that there is a clear project description and it is cost effective? So NIFWIS does a really good job of being very straightforward. There's no reading between the lines. Uh, you know, it's very clear and concise what they're looking for. So pay attention when that RFP comes out. And as field liaisons, we're happy to talk to you about where the opportunities are and if your project uh, would, would seem to fit in here and give you guidance. Next. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Kyle right now, but I do want to also say before I do that, um, NIFWIF is very open to having that conversation where they want to know what's going on with your project idea as well. And we have somebody who's um, on this webinar from the Great Lakes region, um, the project director for NIFWIF, who uh, is Aislinn Gaushi, and she is just amazing. But somebody like Aislinn, who really pays attention and wants to be involved and wants to know where projects might, where the opportunities are. So what Chris said is, you know, if you really do have a project idea or have questions, reach out, reach out to the field liaisons, reach out to the uh, program directors. They welcome that. So Kyle, I'm going to let you go into some of the details about the categories, and then we'll take questions. Perfect, sounds great. Thank you, Joanne. So Joanne covered some of the higher level content on you know, what this program covers and how it all fits together and what your proposal should look like. I'm gonna go a little bit more in detail on the actual categories that folks would be applying to. So NIFWIF tends to structure the NCRF program into four categories. Uh, so you can see those on screen, they're community capacity building and planning, site assessment and preliminary design, got final design and permitting, and then that last one is restoration and monitoring. So the first one's a planning level grant, right? That's where you would go through and go through your stakeholder engagement processes and, and build a community resilience plan or you know, a plan for a specific project. Those last three categories are project level. That's where you start designing and assessing where a project would fit in the community and then actually implementing it in the restoration stage. But it's important to note here that while this is a pipeline, right? And NIFWIF encourages projects to move through this pipeline throughout the life of the project, whether they're funded or not. All that being said, folks should only pick one project category when they're applying for the NCRF. And you would choose that category based on your desired outcome. So if you've already gone through the planning stages and you've done a little bit of site assessment, your design's already at 30 or 35%, the next step would be to work towards that 90 to 100% threshold and thinking about permitting, right? So you would fall into that third category because that's what you're trying to achieve. So I'll go through those each a little bit more in detail, but really just a key thing to remember here is apply to a single category based on the outcome that you're trying to achieve. So capacity building and planning is our first category and projects here tend to last around two years in length. Um, based on this you know, influx of funding that's coming in from the infrastructure bill, we estimate that average awards for 2022 will be anywhere from $300,000 to $350,000. Um, that can range though, right? So that'll change based on the scale of the project, the size of the planning area that you're working off of, the number of partners you have engaged, all of that. Um, but it's important to note that you know, this is an average range or so, um, and, and that's just um, you know, kind of what we're looking at. Again, we're working towards outcome here, right? So the outcome that we would try to achieve with this category is a plan with a prioritized set of nature-based strategies and projects that you would put on the ground to further your resilience goals. And I will just note on this one, you know, there's a lot of stakeholder engagement and a huge focus on capacity building in this category, obviously. Um, but this is a, a newer category for the program. So even though, you know, the NCRF is only four or five years old, this capacity building category is even newer, right? And it really does work as an entry level category for the NCRF. So this helps to get projects into the pipeline, right? And it helps you as an applicant identify what your needs are and how you get to those needs, right? How you use projects on the ground to reach the resilience vision that you're hoping for. So there's some flexibility here and it really is entry level to get folks into the program. Um, so like Joanne mentioned, having those conversations with our team of field liaisons, with the program staff, you know, having those upfront, really, um, that, that's a, a welcome thing for sure. So our second category is site assessment and preliminary design. And projects here tend to last about one year. And again, the estimated average award amount for the 22 cycle is anywhere between a quarter of a million to half a million dollars. Um, we should note, though, that there is no maximum award amount, right? So that's just a, a kind of a guideline to go by um, what NIFWIF expects to see from project proposals. Um, there's definitely an interest in seeing increased award amounts for the 22 grant cycle, um, but this is, you know, an average range that we expect. 
In terms of outcomes here, we're working again towards that preliminary design. So anywhere between 30 to 60% design. And again, working towards a go, no go decision. So at this point, at the end of your project, you should be able to make that determination whether or not the project is feasible and whether or not you'll be moving forward. Um, and also determining what the site or sites are um, for the project. Uh, also here, you know, projects should have been identified in that planning process. So it's okay if you didn't get a grant and you weren't part of the NCRF for phase one for that capacity building process. But on your own with, you know, with your town or through uh, previous grant activities, you should have identified projects in a previous planning process. And then our third category finishes that design piece, right? So this is final design and permitting. Um, and this tends to last about a year and a half. Projects here range from $500,000 to $750,000. Again, that's estimated award amount on average for the 22 cycle. And we're working towards 90 to 100% design. So really aiming to finish up that design phase and get folks ready for implementation. Permitting conversations are a must here. Um, you know, really working towards having the readiness for permitting and positioning projects to be put on the ground. And there may be some baseline monitoring here too. And then the last category is where all the good stuff is, right? That's the implementation and, and where projects get on the ground. So this is restoration and monitoring. Um, projects here tend to be um, anywhere between zero to three years, and then they include one year of monitoring. Um, you know, a pretty big lift here in terms of estimated average award amount. Here we're looking for an average of five to $10 million um, for the 22 cycle. And um, the outcome, of course, is the implementation of those projects and the monitoring thereafter. So projects should have already gone through, you know, all of those key aspects of the pipeline beforehand. They should have been prioritized in plans, the design should have been done, permitting should have been done as well. So really working to get folks moving from you know, step A all the way down to, uh, to the end. So we've got a couple of more specific examples to just show you um, some of the projects that have come in from the Great Lakes area um, over the past few years uh, for the NCRF. So this first example is uh, the Cleveland Harbor Eastern Embayment Resilience Study. Uh, and the acronym for that is CHEERS. So the grantee was the Cleveland Metro Parks Group. And there are actually two awards here. So this, um, this group was awarded twice over the, the span of the NCRF. The first project was $125,000. And that one was for some preliminary design work, right? So that was getting the community engaged, designing um, ideas for the site. And again, really working towards what Joanne mentioned, which was improving habitat, reducing coastal risks, and increasing resiliency. Right. And there were some other benefits as well, thinking about recreation and serving underserved communities. Most recently, though, in the 2021 grant cycle, this project was funded again. So it's just under a million dollars. And this was funded for the third phase, right? Final design and permitting. And that's where the project would work to actually finalize those designs and have those permitting conversations for this, this park, which is um, 80 acres, just under. Um, and it incorporates near shore habitat, there's public parkland, and it's all working to reuse dredge materials to do that, right? They're reducing flood risk, they're reducing wave action, and really improving resiliency, all while also serving an underserved community of uh, 3,500 residents. So you can see a lot of different benefits coming into play here, right? But first and foremost, we've got resilience and fish and wildlife always. Um, several partners were engaged to this project. We've got Cleveland Metro Parks, we've got the Port Authority, the city, the county, the state DNR. I mean, really groups coming from everywhere. We've got the Black Environmental Leaders Association, DOT. So a really great diverse group of uh, partners from around the state and around the region coming together for this project. And we've actually got one more photo too, I'll just throw up on screen uh, to show folks um, you know, another area of design for this one. Uh, but again, you can see a lot of different benefits coming in with those dual benefits of resilience, fish, wildlife, and habitat right up at the top. And then our second example is um, this project titled Reduce Storm-Related Impacts for Lake Superior Coastal Communities Through Habitat Restoration. So this one came in in 2018. So the program was structured a little bit differently. Uh, so it didn't fall into one of those four categories that you saw on screen a few slides back. But the key components that made it competitive 
a lot of those um, still reign supreme in, in the NCRF now. So this was um, to the Superior Watershed Partnership. It was a $2.5 million grant. And the project really worked to design and engineer. Um, There's also an implementation strategy built in there. But again, using habitat restoration to reduce storm-related impacts to the communities around uh, Lake Superior. We can think about scalability here. That's something Joanne mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a 38 acre project, right? So not, you know, a pretty significant chunk of land working to not only reduce storm impacts in general, but doing so to critical community infrastructure. We've got roadways, community resources, public access to the shoreline, really working to protect all of that by creating uh, beach and dune, uh, beach and dune habitat, terrestrial habitat, all for you know, the different fish and wildlife species, but also to enhance resilience. So we will just wrap up um, kind of thinking about how we can tie the grant funding that's coming in from the NCRF um, also with climate finance, right? And there's a really great opportunity here to take advantage of both the NCRF and potential financing opportunities, right? And doing those in tandem. So grants like the NCRF grant are a great way to pilot innovative approaches, right? That can be scaled up over time. And we saw two examples of that on the last few slides. Um, what's also interesting though, is thinking about doing that, right? Scaling projects with a grant while also thinking about climate financing. So while grants by nature are limited, right? You only get so much money from one grant and you have certain requirements with that, but you know, tying those two financing opportunities also allows a community or an organization to scale those projects up and you know, really expand the reach of those. Um, financing also offers an opportunity to generate matching funds. So you know, as Chris mentioned in his presentation, um, there are different match requirements for the different range of grants that are out there, whether they're state or federal or philanthropic. Um, so thinking about how you can generate match on a sustainable basis, financing is a great way to do that. You know, putting in place uh, dedicated funding streams through enterprise funds or whatever it might be, um, making sure that those streams replenish over time so that when a grant comes up and you say, you know, wow, this is a really great fit for the project we've been thinking about, you can pull from those financing streams and provide some match funding. Financing also does a great job to signal your commitment to tackling resilience, right? So if you've got that built into your community already, um, folks are going to look at that and say, you know, you've done your due diligence, you've gone through the process of thinking about resilience already. And again, it's just a stable and dedicated way to take on those big climate investments, right? Well, even with all of the money coming in from the infrastructure bill and everything else, we know the, the price tag on climate change is pretty large. So thinking about how we can tackle that in a sustainable way is, is always good to do. So we will finish up with some contact information. I'll leave this on screen for a few minutes. Um, so if you have any questions for our team, right, the field liaisons for the NCRF at Throw Environmental, you can send us an email. Uh, the email is on screen. It's ncrf at throw-environmental.com. Uh, Joanne also mentioned that Aislinn Gaucher, she's the Great Lakes Programs Director for NIFWIF. She's on the call today um, in the audience. You can shoot her an email with project ideas. Um, but really, you know, take advantage of these, these resources that are available and at your disposal. Um, NIFWIF and the NCRF are, are looking forward to having folks who are interested reach out and think through proposals, um, and we're always happy to help. And then finally, I will just ask my colleague Taylor if she can please uh, put the poll for the attendees up on screen. So you'll see this, and we've got two questions for you. Um, the first one is just asking if you'd like us to follow up with you on any specific project ideas or, you know, virtual or in-person site visits for a project related to the NCRF. So if you like what you heard and you'd like us to follow up, feel free to click yes. And then the second one is asking if any of your projects um, are more specifically related to underserved or environmental justice communities and if you'd like us to follow up there. Give that another 15 or 20 seconds. We should be good to go into questions.
All right, while folks finish up answering that poll, um, I will turn it over to Taylor. I can close out the full Taylor, so don't worry about that. But we do have some time for audience Q&A. So folks, if you haven't already put in your questions in the Q&A box, please feel free to do so. Taylor will facilitate that conversation. Joanne, Chris, myself, uh, Ms. Shannon are all happy to answer any questions you might have. While Taylor's looking for a question or two and people are writing it, I just want to follow up on one comment about Match. We didn't go into too much detail about Match for NCRF because we don't want you to get too hung up on, I don't have the Match in place right now. Think about it in terms of, do you have a good project idea? Think towards um, actually going to the pre-proposal process, right? Think about that and think about your partnerships. Um, there is a match requirement for this, but uh, it's usually one-to-one. -one. Whether things will change, we don't know, but I don't want people to be discouraged if they don't have their match in place at this time or when they apply. So Taylor, are there any questions? It does not look like there are any questions coming in. Um, do you guys have any other aspects of the presentation you'd like to elaborate on a little bit while we wait? Well, I, I encourage people to reach out to think about this program. Certainly, you know, this is unprecedented because of the infrastructure bill, the amount of money. It does not mean it's, it's, it's just going to be anyone who applies is going to get funded. That means it's still going to be very competitive and people should start thinking ahead now. Start putting teams together, talking among your colleagues, thinking about how could this uh, particular fund work best for your community and help move forward on climate resilience. So, so we do have a question um, from Pauline. It's, uh, would the Genesee River watershed be in the project area or even the Finger Lakes? They both entered Lake Ontario. Yes, and Pauline, I would have to go into um, the NCRF footprint, uh, the geographic site, to be able to put that in. Um, but we certainly can follow up with you. And Kyle, um, Kyle, we can certainly do that afterward and get back in touch with Pauline to tell her specifically. Other questions? Looks like uh, we don't have anything currently, but obviously uh, everyone is free to reach out to us via email after this webinar closes as well. Okay. Joanne, I will um, mention one question I had earlier today from another presentation I gave about this program. Um, someone asked about, about the um, funding timeline. So what that looks like, um, you know, when folks should start thinking about this program and, and all of that. So do you wanna just give them a sense of, of what that looks like? Sure. Um, so if it were me, I'd say start thinking about it now, right? Get ready. Um, but it traditionally opens up in early March uh, for pre-proposals. And then it takes about, it's probably open for about six weeks and, you know, April, first week of May, full, if you're invited for a full proposal, you'd work on that. But um, think about it normally in terms of early, early spring, early March. So with that, if there's no other questions, I think Shannon, we can have you close us out and thank you again for wanting to partner and sharing this opportunity with the um, people of, great people of New York. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. This was excellent information. Um, thanks for bringing it to New York's Great Lakes region. We're excited to think about it and, and see what we can come up with. Um, I actually did, before I close out completely, I guess I did have a question. Um, I think, you know, um, you had mentioned that, you know, there were several uh, HUC 8 coastal watersheds that are eligible. I see the mapper is shared. But would a project that perhaps includes several discrete projects along a given uh, streamline reach um, let's say improvements to riparian habitat uh, that also support, um, you know, restored natural hydrology and flood mitigation benefits of a stream be something that could be considered um, eligible for this opportunity. So 
Aislinn's on and she might want to put something in the chat or on mute, but I, in my initial response would be, it sounds like a wonderful opportunity to explore it, providing that it, that the community resilience aspect is front and center, um, but I see Aislinn's jumping on. So <laughs> Aislinn, do you want to comment on that by chance? Sure. Sure, absolutely. Hi, everyone, and great presentation thus far, everyone. Um, I'm Aislinn Gaucher. I am the Great Lakes Program Director at NIFWIF, and I, I want to underscore um, both Joanne and Kyle's invitations to connect with me to discuss project ideas. The sooner the better. I'm thrilled to talk with you about this. Um, when it comes to stream and riparian habitat within the NCRF, absolutely those projects are eligible. I think the key thing to keep in mind, um, when you have a project concept that contains multiple or several discrete sites that are not connected, the important thing for you to consider is that there needs to be a really well-developed and clear need case for why those sites are being proposed for investment. They need to be strategically connected and operate towards a shared objective. So if you have you know, I like to encourage people to think at the problem first. So what are you solving for? What are the key issues that you were trying to address through your approach? And why are these individual sites collectively the solution or a big part of what you're trying to do? So keeping that in mind is critical. Um, you know, typically the, the, the fund has prioritized or, or tended to invest in sites that are larger and sort of one area, but it's totally possible. So again, I encourage you to think strategically about why you're proposing what you're proposing and what solutions um, a, a given project scope would provide both to the resilience question. Resilience you can think of as a way to not only you know, reduce risk but improve a community's ability to bounce back faster when the inevitable happens. Um, so what are the resilience benefits? And then again, as was said many times, what are those meaningful benefits to fish and wildlife? Uh, it doesn't have to be all, but you need to think about nature-based solutions as performing a natural function to benefit wildlife. Um, and the last piece that I'll just mention, there's a lot typically in the Great Lakes region in particular, lots of folks have questions about what critical infrastructure is. So resilience functions are talked about in the National Coastal Resilience Fund RFP um, as protecting critical community infrastructure. And it's something that um, we have to think about kind of broadly and strategically, but I'll just encourage folks to connect with me on that. Critical infrastructure can mean lots of different things, but essentially they're community assets without which the community would have difficulty bouncing back. Roadways, water infrastructure, uh, community assets, cultural assets. So something that we can talk about more in depth, but Again, think about those through lines of why you're proposing what you're proposing, what makes it important, what makes it timely, and envision what your work might look like on the ground to help ensure you're thinking at the right scale for this fund. Aislinn, thank you. And thanks for being on today. And she is just such an amazing resource, everyone. So um, really appreciate it. Shannon, back to you. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, again, offer, you know, our Great Lakes program, we interact routinely with, you know, many of you, uh, many other partners, stakeholders and communities across New York's Great Lakes watershed. We're here to also provide resources, information, um, technical assistance. Um, so please do reach out to us as well if you'd like to discuss your project needs, and we are also happy to connect. And I guess I, uh, I'll just kind of wrap it up here with maybe a little bit of a teaser and thinking about your community or your area of interest. Um, are there existing studies or planning that's been done through say a climate smart communities program or the resilient New York flood studies initiative? Um, or if you're along the Lake Ontario coastal region, um, looking forward to the Department of State's uh, clear uh, long-term uh, resiliency plans and some of the recommendations that are gonna come out of that. These are the kinds of things um, I guess I would just ask that you know everyone consider um, and and kind of use those programs and plans as existing resources uh, to build from. Um, and again, we're always here to help. Uh, please be in touch and uh, thank you everyone for your participation today and thanks again to all the speakers. Thanks to DEC and appreciate it. Bye everyone.